by FYG and the EGP. Um, it's called Emancipatory Action by, for, and of European Youth. And I welcome all of you to this debate. Um, as you might know, youth is one of the major topics that is going to be discussed at this council because we really want to send a strong sign, a strong signal um, that we care for young people and that we want young people to be empowered. Um, to start with, I wanted to explain you a little bit how the process went, how we started to write this resolution, um, and how also we were really much taking care of having uh, the involvement of the member parties of the EGP um, guaranteed during this process. Um, at the last council in Athens, which took place in last autumn, um, FYEG, the Federation of Young European Greens, um, tabled a resolution on youth issues about youth emancipation where we wanted to basically react to many of the discussions that are going on in Europe at the moment about youth unemployment, about the lack of youth participation that we have in our democratic structures. Um, and during the discussions about this resolution, we figured out that we might even want to put this more on the agenda of the EGP and its member parties. So we said that we needed a longer process involving more parties, involving more people in the discussions. So we started a working group. Um, the council decided to, to support this pro uh, process. We started a working group which um, consisted of representatives by FYG and by the EGP that started drafting a paper which was on the basis um, of the resolution that had been tabled and the amendments that had already been tabled to this. Um, then there was a first round where we sent out a first draft um, where the member parties could react, say what they think was lacking maybe, say what they think should be changed. Um, after that the editorial group, the working group, um, prepared another draft um, which would then be um, consolidating all the different positions or trying to consolidate as much as possible. This draft has now been tabled um, to, the, to the council here. Um, and there has been the chance of tabling amendments um, where we also received quite a couple of amendments, many of them really constructive um, and very much adding stuff also to the things that we have been discussing. And first of all, I wanted to thank all of you that um, there was so much involvement of the member parties, so many people contributed and really showed that this is an important topic um, within the EGP. So to start with, uh, thanks for all your additions and comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and now I will come to the to the panel debate that we are going to have now. Um, we wanted to discuss here with you and also to give you the chance um, this resolution. Um, so we came up with having a panel where we have different speakers who were involved in the process to give uh, an opinion on the different sections or the different topics that are part of this resolution. Um, and we wanted to start with a very short introduction round so that the speakers can say who they are. Hello, I'm Michael. I'm also in the board of the Federation of Young European Greens and I was also involved in the editorial group to draft this resolution. Hello, I'm Ines. I'm from Rede Cojoven and thank you for letting me be here. Hi, I'm Delfina. I'm former spokesperson of FYG and I'm working currently with Raul Romeva in the European Parliament and I'm a member of the Catalonian Greens. Just a little thing, there is translation to Spanish in case someone needs it. My name is Guillermo. I am the external relations coordinator of Rece Cujoven and now I'm working for some months in the Green Group of the European Parliament and in the youth unemployment campaign when I'm the liaison of FYG. You know who I am. I chaired the working group together with Mar. I am uh, Mar Garcia. I am from the Verde Europeo, Committee Ejecutivo. Should I say the names? Y, bueno, un poco queríamos, um, después de la presentación que ha hecho Terry de, del proceso de dónde viene este documento y de la importancia sobre los temas de juventud, bueno, también comentaros que este documento ya lo presentamos el jueves en uh, el debate sobre juventud. No sé si algunos de vosotros estuvisteis presentes. Allí un poco nuestros jóvenes verdes y también la sociedad civil que estaba representada, porque estaban representados uh, movimientos de organizaciones souvenirs, teníamos, mostraron que, bueno, que tenemos un diagnóstico claro y conciso que tenemos propuestas para hacer frente a este diagnóstico y que sobre todo tenemos voluntad política para llevarlas a cabo. 
Y lo más importante de todo es que tenemos una actitud de rebeldía para no quedarnos callados, um, que queremos construir un futuro mejor y un futuro además que queremos que empiece hoy. Um, está claro que um, las estadísticas dicen que eh, a pesar de los índices generales del paro, parece que los índices de, de paro juvenil tienden a duplicarse. O sea, tenía aquí algunas cifras, si en Austria el paro es del 4,6, el paro juvenil es del 8,9, en Alemania es del 5,4, el paro juvenil es del 7,7 y si vamos a los países del sur, en España es del 26,3 y el paro juvenil es del 57,5. O sea que el tema es que esto es muy importante para el Partido Verde Europeo y por eso queremos que sea un tema eh, eh, principal en nuestra campaña y que además creemos que es un tema que no solo se puede atacar con políticas de relanzamiento, sino que tiene que haber políticas, políticas específicas que, sea, que estén orientadas a, a la juventud. Um, básicamente, eh, eso, visualizar que para nosotros el tema de la juventud es crucial y os animo a un buen debate. You are gathering all the microphones on your side. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Ma, for the introduction to, to the topic. Um, now we are going to continue with having um, four topics presented by our four speakers um, that are basically gathering all the main points that we are trying to make in this resolution. Um, these topics will mainly be um, about economy, economic issues, because we think that for young people and in order to empower young people, it's very important to have an economy that also gives them chances in the labor market. Um, Micha will present that. Then we will have um, Delfina presenting the topic of youth guarantee and social issues that we have put very much into the focus of this um, resolution as well. Um, then we will have Guillaume Uh, presenting a little bit about the education topic because this is something that um, really is a crucial part of um, most lives of, of young people and then we will have Ines um, introducing a little bit the topic of uh, youth participation and um, we will structure it like this that we will give the chance um, to our four speakers to introduce a little bit um, about what is said in the resolution about the topic and then we will give the chance to you to the people in the audience to react on that to make comments, to make additions, also to criticize what has been said. So now I would like to ask Micha to start with the part on the economic empowerment of young people. Okay. Good. Um, the, the economic part is... Um, is at the end of the resolution, but it's in the beginning of, of our thinking because um, when we say reclaim the future, we say it in this particular context in times of crisis. And um, so the, the question is, from whom do we have to reclaim our future? And it's basically the, the economic sphere with, which has kind of captured the future and which has brought us into a precarious situation, especially as the youth. Um, the future is currently kind of eaten up. We have in Greece two-thirds uh, of the youth being unemployed, and we have in Spain 57% of the youth being unemployed. And funnily enough, the movement in Spain from the youth is called Juventud sin futuro, the youth without future. So we try to be the youth with future, but in order to be the youth with future, we have to change our economy. And that's why we thought it's very important to put the part of economy in this paper when we talk about youth policies. So what kind of economy do we have? We have right now this economy which is um, oriented to profit maximization, which is very much financial heavy, which is neoliberal, which does not see the main principle to service the human being, but the human being is, has to service the ideology of profit maximization. It is an economy which preaches freedom, but in the end it leads to precariousness. We've heard, in, especially in Spain here, people um, do internships, unpaid internships for two years, 
they have to, they they cannot afford their own housing they have to work aside their internships this is precariousness this is the new form of slavery which this economy brought about and so we have to stop that and that's why our paper is called go from the economy as it is right now to a re-economy because we have to rethink how we want to engage and how the economy should be structured and i think we tried it a little bit um, especially with the focus on, on creating jobs, but then also with the focus on, on empowering the youth to act and do what they want to do, because it's not only that they have to, be, um, that they have to adjust themselves towards the economy, but the young people have to shape the economy. And First of all, when we, when we talk about this new economy, we can think about a very successful project, um, which is the renewable energies. Um, renewable energies have created millions of jobs, 2.3 millions of jobs worldwide, and it's one of the most successful projects we have, for instance, in Germany. And we need to invest in the renewable energies sector in order to um, decarbonize, um, our economy, which then also brings about a more um, intergenerational justice for us use, because we will have to deal with um, the follow-up of, of, of climate change. But it will also bring about um, the democratization of the economy, because um, right now the, the oil sector is controlled by these huge companies, and the renewable energies are the, is, are the small, more democratic companies. Um, we also need to, um, we, we were thinking about industry. Um, it's quite peculiar that, that we as Greens, we want to re-industrialize. But what happens right now is that when we look at, at, at the economy, we have, we imagine it as a, as a human being. Then it has a head, the head, which is the finance, is very big, very heavy, and the, the, the core, and the basis is very weak, which is the industrial, the industrial basis of our economy is very weak. So this economy falls. Yeah? It is loaded on top and the, the, the feet cannot hold it. So we need to restructure it, make the belly bigger and make the head smaller. Um, and how do we do that? By re-regulating by re it. We have to close tax havens, we have to introduce the financial transaction tax, we have to put a price on CO2 emissions. Um, this will create jobs, because right now the financial sector is just laying off people everywhere. And this is not sustainable, the financial sector. The industrial sector is sustainable, but it needs to be sustainable in terms of jobs and in terms of ecology. Um, I think I already spoke a little bit too much, so let me just um, finish. Another point which is, which is really important is that when we have so many unemployed youth, this, leads, this, is, not, this is not only an economic, economical problem, but it's also a psychological problem. The people don't fear, um, or the people are seen as, or the youth is seen as useless, the youth is seen as lazy, the youth becomes lethargic. But we need to empower the, the youth not only to get into jobs, which we'll ta ta um, talk later about the youth guarantee, but also to, to be able to um, implement their dreams. We need to support them with implementing their dreams. And as we see right now, it's amazing what, for instance, Red Ecke Hoven, they are, they are working, yeah? they're doing a lot which is unpaid work, but it is, this is work. We have to rethink what work is because everybody's working. Everybody's engaged. Everybody wants to contribute to the society. This is work and we need to support it. We can support it by, this is kind of, these are the social entrepreneurs of, of, our, of our time. And um, so it's, it's about um, having startups, supporting the youth, supporting the youth to, to, um, to implement their dreams. Um, with special schemes for this. Um, Michael. Yes. <laughs> and a last point, um, which, I, which I really um, want to point out. We have all our ideas, not only in the, in the resolution, but we also had a publication from the FYG, which is called actually Reclaim the Future. 
it shows that there's learning possible because when you look here, there is also somebody who says reclaim the future. I think this publication was first, so we inspired the EGP. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, the way in which we're going to conduct this is that now you are uh, going to be given the opportunity of joining the discussion with regard to the ideas that have been presented uh, in the realm of the economy. Uh, and we would s collect a few contributions from the floor and then continue with the next part of uh, the resolution. Uh, but we are flexible here, so if there are not too many contributions from the floor, we will uh, continue and maybe you, we can come back to that later also. But if anyone asks for uh, the floor, please show your hands. And um, yes, in the back, the lady in the second, uh, second row from the back. Buenos días, me llamo María Merello, me llamo María Merello, pertenezco a ECO, soy portavoz de ECO Andalucía y quería trasladar a los jóvenes a ver qué opinan sobre el futuro del trabajo. Nosotros creemos que es imposible que en esta sociedad postindustrial haya trabajo de ocho horas para todo el mundo. Por lo tanto, creo que es importante discutir sobre una renta básica universal que haga que todo el mundo pueda trabajar menos horas, pero que trabajemos todos. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, and there's someone in the third row, in the middle, here. Uh, will you stand up so that the mic will find you? Hello, Antonio from Young Greens from Macedonia. Uh, regarding the economy, just my short contribution. I, I think it requires a change in perspective in the measure of success of the societies. Uh, until we actually have the GDP as the main I indicator of success, we will always focus on economy and what we should strive for to, 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 to inform is sustainable development as a perspective. So I would say that we uh, really need to change the I I I indicators, how the countries are measured by who is developed or uh, underdeveloped. Because I believe while we become seniors, uh, it will be the countries that are n the, the least n uh, explored in terms of nature will be the developed ones instead of now the developed countries that are actually most economically growing because they're exploring the natural resources. So it becomes in a, it's a very crucial uh, thing that uh, in the measure of success we actually put environment, we put the natural wealth, and this is how we measure the success of the countries. So maybe Macedonia then will become a developed country sooner than we think. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Anna? Lovely, thank you. Uh, I'm very excited that I heard the word social enterprise. And, uh, and that's something that, sorry, again, I'm apologizing, a bit of a habit. But uh, I think it's brilliant that young people especially should take this concept and run with it. Because we are really talking about what the previous person was also very well talking about, the impact measurement and how even in business world we have to also consider ecological and, and social uh, impact. And, and we have a tool in business world called social enterprise or social business that actually the EU is already recognizing. It's, it's putting a lot of effort and resources into this. For the next period, starting from 2014, there is money to, to be had for social innovation, for social investment, for social enterprise. And I think the young people especially should run with this because it is the business that young people through research we know and talking actually love. And that's something something to, to, to look at as Greens because nobody, not a single other party has really captured this. So we need to do this and claim to, to be the forefront runner with this one. Thank you. Thank you. And there's 
a fourth and for the time being the last contribution in this round here in the front. Thank you, Lionel Tellen from Ecolo. So I briefly presented the ID uh, Friday at the first uh, pre-debate uh, from the, the conference. Um, well, as you know, we are still, since the Treaty of Lisbon in 1999, in a world, in uh, e Europe, where we are led by a system called Flex Security, where the flexibility is given to the enterprise at the, uh, with a, as a, a, an exchange, the security which is given by the employability. And it seems that enterprises, private firms, have really understood the fact that they can flexibilize as a maximum, to a maximum, the flexibility of the employees, but they do not understand that they should improve the employability of the same employees. It means that only the people that have talent and skills will receive trainings, while the other will receive just nothing. If we install a system, or if we think about a system where, let's say, for example, every four years, people, employees, have to go on vocational training for three months, three months, all employees, every four years, will liberate 14 million jobs in the EU, and even more in the world Europe. And I think that a, a, such a system exists more or less in Denmark or Scandinavian countries. We, wish, we should explore this. But this is one possibility and a feasible possibility because the Europe, the EU, has until now well, pushed for flex security but without given, giving any means for the security part. Thank you. Thank you also. And I think... Uh, there have been uh, very interesting uh, contributions, and I'm sure if the, the Danish would have the opportunity to take the floor, they would clearly also underline that there and our Danish uh, SF party, that they uh, take a very different view with regard to flexibility from what you have criticized, because what some people in Europe are advocating as flexibility that is not the Danish experience, not at all. So this is be trying, some people are trying to hijack an agenda for their own purposes. But we will be able to come back to that in the next round, and uh, uh, I think Delfina should now take the floor. Hi. Um, I'd, I'd, I will not try to reply all your comments. Um, I think for just shortly for the redistribution of working time, there was there has been a really long discussion with the European Greens where we all stand that there should be some kind of redistribution. And of course, that will affect the way we create work uh, for the young people. Um, about the indicators also, you can say like uh, youth unemployment should become one of the biggest indicators in the EU when they take in recommendations, for example. But going more into details, what the papers say and what the European Greens have been doing, I would like to talk about the youth warranty. I don't know if you have fine outside, we have made this nice flyer with FYG and the Green Group where I explain what is the youth warranty and why we need it. Because for those who don't know, this was uh, an idea that was born with the inside the Green Group in 2009. So I guess Berta is around here and the employment people from the Green Group in the European Parliament. And they, are the, they were the one putting that on the table. So it's a pretty much green idea that I think now we, we have the opportunity to capitalize and campaign at national, regional and local level about this. What is the youth warranty? It is an instrument that reclaims a right for young people not to be let alone when they are not in formal education or not with a job. Meaning that while you are out of the job market or you are not in formal education, they have to offer you, like the, the administration and the state has to provide you with the right to access to a job, to have education, a trainership or an apprenticeship. One of the four options, at least for four months. That's a really idea that stresses the necessity to protect the young people rights. Is this enough? Well, of course not. And it, this will uh, result out the situation of almost 60% of youth unemployment in Spain and in Greece. 
I don't think so. This is the right that you, you have and should work when you have a normal labor market working. But in South European countries, we have an extraordinary situation. And this definitely will not be enough. If you offer someone a traineeship for four more months more, it will definitely not warranty that afterwards you can enter a regular job. So this is why we think we should campaign and definitely strengthen as the youth warranty. And it was a great success that the European Council put that as a council recommendation. So now there is kind of political agreement among all member states in the EU are in favor of this year's warranty. But be careful not to trust them all the, what they are saying. Because this is just a commitment, like a wording. But now we, it's our societies, on the young people in our member states, and our green organization, to push our member states to make this come true. And to make this be implemented and really take it as a right not just something that it's on the paper. And there are other things that have to complement these measures, such as this uh, uh, good quality of internships and traineeships. Make sure people it's pay for that, that it's an education process, that we are not exploited and treated as cheap workers. This is not where we're going to go. And we have to make clear that all kind of issues are not in detriment for more um, precariousness, as was put in the minute. It's, it's not about flexibilizing the labor market more than it is. It's just about warranty rights of people. And we have the opportunity now to campaign on a single basis at the European level, to have a strong message everywhere, and make it clear that it's not only about South Europe. It is about what's going on in Germany with mini jobs. It is about what's going with all the inequalities in the rest of Europe. It's not only about 60% in South European countries. It is about redistribution. It's about fairness. And the youth warranty allow us to start this campaign, but we have to go further. And this is, I think, where we have to go and campaign in the street. And I will leave it here. Thanks. Thank you, Delfina. And now back to you. Who wants to come in? I think Peter had already his hand up in the, in the last round. So give a, give a mic to Peter. Yeah, I think I was, I think I was actually asked to, uh, to take the floor. I'm uh, Peter from Denmark, uh, the vice uh, chairman of SF, uh, a governing party. And uh, one of the things uh, that's important to stress about flexicurity is that it comes with two sides. And the, one of the sides that's missing is the security side in uh, the way the rest of Europe is trying to implement it. You have to have a very strong web of social security, uh, meaning uh, high social pensions. So if you fall into unemployment, you're, uh, you're secured uh, a basic income uh, at a reasonable level. And then you have to have a very active labor market uh, where you, uh, you get help from the state or your local municipality to, to re-enter the, the job market. They're trying to help you find a uh, new education or, or new job openings. And with our new government, we've uh, strengthened that. We've also, uh, and I think that's uh, an important thing, uh, we've also uh, made guarantees uh, like the, the European Youth Guarantee that every youth starting a vocational training is guaranteed the right to an apprenticeship. Uh, if not at a company, then at school, which is the second best, but it's at least an, uh, an option. What's not good in Denmark is that uh, the last thing the right-wing government uh, did before uh, they lost the election was they cut the early retirement uh, pensions. And they were actually made in the, in the early 80s in order to help young people enter the, uh, the labor market uh, so that uh, the elderly could go uh, on, on pension uh, before. Now that, uh, that possibility is uh, being taken away from us, so I need to be uh, 73 before I can go on, on a pension. Uh, uh, before it, was, it, it, would be, uh, it would be 60 uh, years of age for, for everyone. Um, so that's, uh, that's a drawback, but uh, we're trying in other areas to uh, improve uh, the, the, the uh, conditions of youth. And then obviously uh, we, we want to have more young people uh, in politics. Uh, being 27, I can, I can say that. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, the next um, was, uh, as far as I can see, Ska, and then uh, Wilhelm.
Okay, thank you. My name is Ska. Um, I would like to stress what Delfina said, that it's not just about guaranteeing that there is a job or apprenticeship, whatever. It's about the quality of the apprenticeship and the job. And that is something I think that the member parties of EGP our screens can really contribute to the whole project by monitoring what sort of apprenticeships, jobs are the governments offering? Are they actually implementing the youth guarantee as they have pledged on European level? And since there will be some sort of monitoring of the youth guarantee, but only for some specific countries within the European semester, I think it's extremely vital that we Greens watch out what's actually happening, what's the quality, is it helping young people to get into the labour market, is it actually providing good jobs and not just apprenticeships for free for the employer, and uh, to put that together, to put it together at European level so that EGP, the Green Group, all the member parties can together say we're missing implementation here, this is going wrong, and to really bring this instrument further, not just say, yes, we got it, now it's over, not at all. It's just the first step in this. Thanks. Thank you, Ska. Wilhelm, please. Here in the, in, in the middle. Well, speaking Wilhelm Knaben from uh, Germany, for, and also from the ENGS, the European Network of Green Seniors. And I want to say, you have done a very good, made a very good paper the, and shown the problems of youth in European countries. And you also did a good job to describe what we could do, what actions are necessary. And uh, I want to give a promise. I mean, we old people can help you. We give the promise that we will report you, that we try to do our best that you will have a future, a future in peace and a future in, 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 in understanding nature. And look at my youth. I was drafted with 18 to the war, going to the war, a soldier. And three years I had to be a soldier. And I came back with the, with the, with the conviction I will never take a weapon again in my hands. And I start to lose a But now, when we are in the present, we have no, not, we have not the problem of war. Serbians and Croats have, uh, some, some years ago, they had still the same problem. But now, we know to find a solution for the future and for youth. We must understand nature and we must give young people the opportunity to come in contact with nature that you are describing the language uh, learning. It's very important, but uh, to understanding what's going on in nature, in really, in, 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 the, in the soil, in the plants, and with the, with the animals, and with the weather and the climate, to understand this, that it needs contact. And so I'd rather report, or rather to, um, uh, recommend, support those activities which help young people to come in contact with nature. That was my last word. Thank you very much, Wilhelm. If you allow me one bit of information about the youth guarantee, uh, sort of underlining what Delfina said earlier. The youth guarantee has been agreed to. But now the question is, how is it going to be implemented? And just a few numbers. According to the statistics that I know, there are 18 member states where at least one region has a youth unemployment rate of above 25%. All these regions qualify uh, for, uh, as recipients for the 6 billion euro that's been agreed to by the European Council. Now, if you break that down, and the six billion, that's not six billion annually, that's six billion over a period of seven years. So if you break that down, uh, it, it results in less than 150 euro per capita and year. That's what's, what the money is out there. Now, some of us Greens have advocated, and, and, and Delfina has been part of that, I think, that we should 
lower the bar that we should not only think about the regions with 25 plus also the regions with let's say 20 percent plus youth unemployment the number of the regions would of course increase and that has also been calculated and if we would do that then the amount per capita and year would sink to less than 70 euro per person and year so I think it's obvious that the amount of money that is being put on the table is by far not enough to finance a worthwhile youth guarantee. We should keep that in mind for our daily policy making. And I would now like, yeah, uh, Delfina will take the floor and then right after that Guillermo will open the next part of our discussion. A small thing on the current negotiations on the youth guarantee. I mean, one is the compromise as, as far as I understood of the council, and then it's the negotiation that is dealing within the council, the commission, and the parliament on the European Social Fund and how to develop that. There are interesting aspects, as Reinhard, you were pointing out, about this, whether you apply it to regions with above or a priority for those regions with above 25% or 20% youth unemployment, and they are also like the age restriction. If you apply it for young people between 18 and 24 years old, or 18 or 30. Those are interesting things. There are also really important things that is what is going to happen with the co-founding of the member state that they have to provide. As you know, the European Social Fund has to have a co-financing from the member state. And our question is that in situations like in Greece, I'm seeing Nikos right now, or in Spain, where there's not cash, or in Ireland, and they're applying a lot of uh, austerity and strong uh, cuts, how those co-finding projects will come through. So this is where we are trying to think whether for those specific countries there should be a correlation with the flexibility to the goals of deficit and debt. And, what, and then we have to make clear that the goal should not be only reduce uh, deficit and achieve this uh, budgetary sustainability, so on and so forth, but really to reduce youth unemployment. And the youth warranty has to take that into account. We cannot implement this measure without taking into consideration the memorandums of understanding and all the austerity plans that are being forced to be taken in South of Europe. Hi. Well, I'm going to talk about education and the measures we need, we think we need to, to tackle with regards to it. Education is a fundamental way in order to ensure and, and improve the organization of society, the inclusion of individuals, and their freedom in the end. Education is about future, but a future that must be tackled from now, and it's about present too. Education must ensure the improvement of the conditions and the situation of young people now, and must, and must reduce the youth unemployment rates in a short or medium term. Education must guarantee quality. Everybody, every citizen, every single member of the society must have the right to get access to the university. Everybody must, must have the right to access to university regardless of his circumstances of birth, regardless of uh, his social, economic, or fam fam family background, regardless of even the, uh, his parents' advice. Everybody must be able to go to, to university, go to the secondary school, go to education, and the state must definitely ensure and guarantee that this is possible. We absolutely need a proper, good quality, public education for everybody, and the, states is, the state is in charge of guaranteeing this. We are living in some countries, such as Spain, the fact of a government trying to tackle the crisis by means of the austerity measures is actually increasing the tuition fees, making impossible for, for some people continuing, continuing the education or even getting studying one. To get these goals, we absolutely think that we need a comprehensive change of the educational system. Educational system must give those practical skills, skills for young people to find a job and to carry out this job afterwards. But this doesn't mean to transfer or to transform 
in the university or the tertiary education into a training room for firms and for companies. We need to reduce the gap between the educational sector and the labor, labor sector without losing or without destroying those areas of knowledge or those parts of the education that doesn't have an immediate, evident, practical outcome. Educational system must give the opportunity to, for a second and a third chance. Those who actually failed at some stage of education, those who don't have success at some point of education, must have the possibility to get in again, to try again, and to, to be reinserted again, in order to not be excluded. This is especially important in terms of, of early school leavers and regarding the youth unemployment rates of this sector, especially in countries as Spain or in southern countries. We need to, to stop the drain of young people dropping out of a school nowadays, today, still today, and especially to, we need to give a solution for those who already, already dropped out of, out of a school 10 years ago, going to feed for example, the real estate bubble in some countries as Spain, and now they have no job, no education, and no prospective. We really absolutely need to give a solution. Just, just two, two more lines in order to, to finish. Um, it's absolutely, absolutely important at the, same, at the same level. The fact of making an open, an open educational system. Educational system must have more, at least multiple entrance and exit points. We need to permit that people that want to get out from the educational system to go for a more vocational, even professional uh, training or experience can get back again and we can accept them again. We need to increase mobility between more theoretical and more vocational trainings in order to enable dynamics between different social strata in order to break the social frontiers, not only on an educational level. In order to, to finish, we already have one, one solution, at least in Europe, the dual system of vocational training and education. The aim of this is to link the practical work experience with an ongoing uh, ed training or education. This could be especially interesting in countries as Spain or southern countries where we need, we have a need of education for many young people and to continue further education, but at the same time as they are g gaining some economic outcome in order to, to continue subsisting. This is then uh, just stressing the point of democratizing the education, educational system. We need to meet the, and I'm finishing, and we need to meet... That should be the last and final finish. <laughs> I promise. We need to meet the need of those coming from more general formal education, for those coming from more vocational or with a social experience, uh, more, those coming for more non-formal uh, learning uh, processes. Just the conclusion. It's absolutely <laughs> conclusion. No, 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 no. Okay. no. After the finish, there is no conclusion okay, anymore. Thank you. <laughs>running a bit short on time, so I will take maybe just two um, uh, contributions from the floor. If you would show your hand over there, and uh, Panu, yep. Uh, would you stand up, please, in the second row? Yes. My name is Jose Antonio Fuertes. I'm from Spain. Eh, bueno, lo hablar en público no es lo mío, me pongo nervioso, se me van las ideas rápidamente. En España somos un partido anecdótico prácticamente. Aquí estamos hablando de ideas muy bonitas y genéricas, pero que eh, dudo mucho que lleguen a los millones de jóvenes y a los, y a los miles de empleados de las empresas que hay eh, relacionadas con este sector. Yo creo que... Eh, eh, la gente está cansada de oír eh, cosas genéricas. En España están los partidos eh, muy desprestigiados, todos, 
y la gente mete a todos los partidos en el mismo saco. Eh, no quieren ya oír hablar de partidos. Al final van a votar por obligación, no sé por qué, porque nadie quiere oír hablar de los partidos en su inmensa mayoría. En mi opinión, si queremos cambiar las cosas, hay que llegar a gobernar. Para llegar a gobernar hay que tener mayoría, tienen que votarnos. Para votarnos tenemos que tener una masa importante de gente. Eh, yo soy una persona pragmática, entonces eh, eh, yo creo que lo imprescindible y urgente sería establecer una estrategia de comunicación para llegar a todos esos jóvenes que están mm, perdidos, la gente está eh, totalmente desanimada eh, y me parece imprescindible llegar con ideas claras y concretas y no con cosas genéricas eh, a los miles de jóvenes y a los miles de empleados, sobre todo apoyándonos en la economía. Look, would you, would you care commenting on some of the specific ideas that would help us a lot? Sorry. <laughs> Just later, please. <laughs> well, okay. Thank you. Oh, Look, we, we are the... the The very purpose of this discussion is discussing the specific ideas that we have put on the table. So I would really invite you to comment on some of the specific ideas because that would indeed help us. Are the specific ideas like dual vocational training, are they good? Will we uh, make use of them? Please. Continue. Eso es una idea. Evidentemente hay muchas otras más. Me refiero en general, concretar hechos, artículo, casi artículo por artículo en las leyes. Lo que hay que cambiar, eh, decir una estrategia y un plan, pero mm, con palabras sencillas explicado a la gente, porque si no acabará todo entre nosotros y no llega el mensaje a la gente, sobre todo a los jóvenes. Ok, thank you. Uh, Panu, you're next. Okay, I have a couple of words concerning the schooling and and uh, concerning the primary schools, which actually from in Finland have been quite successful. And I would like to point two issues from the primary schools, which should be in in our program. One is that the thing is that that we should encourage or force the, all the countries that the teachers in primary schools they have master degree. We have in Finland master degree in the primary school teachers, and that has led that it's hardest place to get into universities to become a teacher. It's a very wanted place, which differs to very many other countries. And this is one thing I think that what we should really think that that uh, helps to get the, the best people to become a teachers, and that is one very important issue. The other one is that what we I think that what is worrying in the uh, how it seems to. The development is that that now, normally in Europe, I think that it has been quite good that w whatever school you take, the the primary school, when you go out from primary school, you are not already then in the different classes. But now it seems that there is better pl primary school and worse primary school, and the differences between the primary schools are so huge that it depends when you are three or four or five, and it depends which school you are put, what is your future, and and that's why I think that. That, that the primary level should be so that whatever primary school you go out, you have the, the same possibilities to continue. Thank you very much. Uh, and let me turn it over to Ines now to cover uh, our fourth uh, aspect, which is youth participation. Please. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. Um, it is always said that youth is the future, uh, but this cannot be used as a way to postpone the solutions for our present, because then we, don't, we won't have a future. As we all said, in Spain we had a, a more than 57% rate of youth unemployment, education prices getting higher and higher, and a huge precariousness in jobs when we have it. Uh, we're being completely ignored by the government and most of the parties, and left out when it comes to finding solutions for us. Uh, as Terry said before and on Thursday at our youth debate, we must do politics on, for and by the youth. I would like to insist on the by uh, concept. We as youth don't want to be the pretty faces, faces of parties. We want our voice to be heard and taken into account. But this voice is different, the youth voice, and we want it to be different. We are creative and we can really change the way of doing politics. 
As youth organizations, we must be key actors in ensuring social inclusion and cohesion, ecological and environmental responsibility, political participation and democracy, and political accountability. For this, the European Union must start an open and transparent process of consultation with youth organizations, since no one uh, understands youth problems as us. We will only reach full emancipation by an active participation. This is why voting age, age should, low, should be lowered at least to 16 years old, with an increase in political education in formal and non-formal education systems. Yesterday, after one of the parallel sessions, uh, the FYEG one, uh, a colleague from ECWO who was uh, um, working as a volunteer in the room told me that the arguments against lowering voting age are the same that were used against wo women voting. Uh, like, they're not well informed, they're really uh, easy influenced, so let's stop this and allow youth to decide on the future and on the present. Uh, incorporating youth comes with taking into account the diverse European realities. Youth is one of the most di diver divergent uh, social groups and there is, and, uh, there is, and we must take uh, specific measures for young people with disabilities, youth uh, from poorer families, rural youth and young migrants. This last group is especially important for southern Europeans since we're being forced to leave our countries to find decent education and jobs. Gen of course, uh, gender issues must not be forgotten when addressing young situation. So just to finish, we have a voice and it must be heard. Thank you. Uh, I will give Jakob, uh, the co-chair of FYG, the uh, opportunity to intervene. And then I will turn it over uh, for some final remarks to Terry. Jakob, please. Thank you very much. I'm Jakob uh, from FYG, co spokesperson of the Federation of Young European Greens, the Young Greens. Uh, and I would like to make a, a final remark on direct democracy. I think it hasn't been mentioned sufficiently. Uh, it has been mentioned in, on Thursday in the youth debate. I think it's really important for young people to feel uh, they can ta make a difference in the society, um, that they can actually change something in politics. And often, particularly with the traditional parties in, in Central Europe, where I experience it personally, uh, young people have the impression, no matter what they do, the, the traditional parties are not going to change anything anyways. And I think that direct democracy really gives uh, young people the opportunity to change things. And I hope that this is also something that Green parties can stress a bit more in uh, their uh, national states. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jakob. Um, I think these were also really nice closing words for the for the discussion. I think we got a lot of input, great input from many different people. Um, and this is basically um, just a starting point because, as you know, tomorrow we will also continue discussing on the amendments and the specific proposals that we have put into the paper, into the resolutions that we uh, into the resolution that we have tabled. Um, and just to make one comment on this, for us as a drafting group, it was really, really important to, of course, also give a general idea about what what youth means to us, but to also come to nine very concrete demands that we want to put on the table that we want to implement as green parties in order to empower and emancipate youth. Um, and tomorrow we will then finally discuss if we think that these nine demands are the ones that we want to put forward. So thank you all for your contributions. Thank you for this great debate. I think a lot has been mentioned. Um, many things uh, have also been added um, to the points that our great four speakers um, have mentioned. So thanks again to our four speakers as well, Micha, Ines, Delfina and Guillermo. <laughs> and just to mention one again, uh, once again, um, there are um, several things that you can also have a look at. For example, the Reclaim the Future publication and our um, flyers for the Youth Guarantee. 
um, this will be part of a broader youth campaign that we want to put because we think that this will be one of the topics, especially with regards to the election campaign that is going to happen in 2014, that will be a very crucial debate uh, for the European sphere. And this is why the Green Group, as well as the EGP, as well as FYG and uh, the Green European Foundation will put a lot of effort into organizing youth debates, into organizing um, street actions, campaigns, uh, uh, creating material to really put this topic forward and we hope that as many member parties as possible and as many of you as possible will join this and um, recognize this as one of the major topics that we will put for 2014. Um, and just to have a very quick advertisement block, <laughs> um, FYG is also having a big debate on the topic next week. We are going to have our General Assembly in Mechelen in Belgium and uh, we will discuss this together with uh, Hermann von Rompuy, the um, Council President, the EU Council President. This will for sure be an interesting discussion. Uh, and also uh, Rebecca Harms and Guy Verhofstadt will already have the chance to stand up to each other, which we have been discussing before. Um, and they will give their ideas uh, about how youth can uh, have a future in Europe. Um, and if you happen to be in Belgium, you are more than invited. It's next Friday. Um, and apart from that, we are looking forward to the debate tomorrow. Um, just for a technical point, um, all the amendments and all the uh, consolidated compromise that we have already found, um, you can either find out uh, online or it's also outside printed copies of all the amendments that we have already agreed upon. So please have a look and join the debate and join our campaign for the next year and for the future. Thanks a lot. And um, just to quickly mention what is going to happen now in the program, um, we now have the presentation of the candidates of the Global Greens coordination. So don't run away. Um, we will just have a little bit uh, changing of the setting and then we will continue. Thanks. <laughs>